Hi, everyone. Now, after hearing this last piece, I just totally want to recontextualize what I'm going to say in, in the spirit of, and I will say in defense of the, the Americans, I lived in a loft that uh, had been there since the, yeah, had, had had a bidet there since the 60s. And so we used the bidet, which is like thought it was a normal thing. This is in the 80, late 80s and, and 90s. So I, I'm a big fan of the bidet, and uh, I was a big fan to, uh, of this uh, toilet because you could flush the uh, paper. I'm just saying, I might, at where I'm staying, you can't flush the paper. You got to put in the, you know. Same thing here. Oh, you can't flush the paper? Y'all, I'm sorry I flushed the paper. <laughs> that was me. Is this my, is this my, okay, look at this. Okay. So, uh, we're talking about maintenance, which is such a fantastic, broad, useful word. Um, the two ways I want to employ the word today, I'm going to discuss maintenance of sound and the maintenance of spirit and how they're related. I want to describe uh, a musical behavior or a technique, if you're a musician, which is the act of maintaining a tone to sustain a tone, uh, to sustain a sound so that it is suspended in space and is kept sort of hovering. I would then like to use maintenance to describe the usage of music and sound, and specifically this type of sustained tone uh, as a means to maintain the spirit and as a means to establish and sustain a sense of connection with the universal. Um, that sounds like a lot of stuff to get through, so let me, let me, just, uh, let me just get into it. And then I want to draw parallels with the type of meditation that I do because I'm also a meditation instructor and I can't uh, disassociate the, that because they're of a piece for me. So uh, I want to then identify two very broad classifications of sound in music, uh, or rather sound, yep. music and sound art. Okay, what, what's the difference? I would like to suggest these distinctions. Music and sound art are pretty subjective and not very useful. Um, and that they're based on what can be commodified and what can't be commodified. And, you know, we should ask ourselves questions about where we find... I, but uh, by music, I mean everything. Like hip-hop, pop, classical music, just about everything that one might consider tonal, you know. And by sound art, I consider things that exist in a gallery or a public space or a, um, a museum or, you know. And I think it says a lot about... Uh, we could go into the politics of, you know, who's allowed in these spaces and, you know, how uh, they've sort of separated us in this way using even these such things. And you were talking about commodification earlier. Uh, I'm talking about the commodification of sound. Uh, anyway, sound art, yeah, we, we might find in a gallery or a public space. Uh, it's funded by the state in the Scandinavia, which is quite new to me. I'm an American and nobody gives a fuck about art in the US. Obviously, at least the government doesn't. So they don't pay for it. We do it ourselves. But I've been living in Sweden, uh, where there's just loads of money to be had for art, which is just fabulous. So here I am. And uh, by the dint of the government, they're paying for this entire event that is happening tomorrow here in Beirut, um, which is abs I mean, to me is stunning. Um, and I don't feel like I'm cheating anybody because I really think it's a it's a it's a been a dream of mine. Um, I'm going to add another category, which is functional music. And in here I'm including my day job, which is film scoring, making music that is supposed to support a commercial product. Um, I'm also including spa music, you know. I'm including commercial sound branding, like the Microsoft Boudin sound, which was actually uh, made by Brian Eno, the famous ambient composer, and he said it was one of the the most difficult thing he'd ever had to do. And it's about 45 seconds in length, and that's precisely why, because it was so hard. It had to communicate so many things in 45 seconds. Time, I'm gonna get into that. So functional music is all about the context. And Martin, I think of you when I use the word context. It feels like a Martin type word. It's all about the setting in which you find, uh, it's, it, it, it's created expressly to be placed in a very particular spot or situation. Um, so, I, I'd say that this area of functional music rivals pop music um, for our attention and our brain space and our money, and as you see, it encompasses both sound art and music, I would say. 
Um, and it's truly a capitalistic sales element. It buffers up a product. It makes a paid experience more, feel more total somehow. It uh, uh, hustles along your shopping experience. Um, it assists us in selling uh, an item or buying an item. So I'm going to skip the rest of this stuff because I'm going to want to get to what I want the important stuff that I want to talk about. Okay, um, it's my contention that uh, me this. Let me. I want to. I want to get to this. Okay, I'll describe one method that I and many others are working with, uh, with the goal being to detach what should be a mystical experience because fundamentally music is supposed to be a spiritual experience. We, we've come a long way from there. To detach m the, what should be a mystical experience from commodification. Nicholas was speaking about the type of commodification. I'm talking about the commodification of magic and I'm talking about something called transcendent sound. And if we have any desire to have music and sound resonate on a deeper level in our spirits, we have to look at this type of uh, classification of sound. The way I see it, transcendent sound is pan-genre, and it's, uh, it's pan-cultural. It can be comprised of all musical or sonic forms that encourage a greater sense of self or community, or that connect us to something universal, something larger. Um, pop music and dance music and this sort of thing operates on this tension and release access. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean? So it operates on this sort of like, you know, you're in the club and the, 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 the music's moving, then the, the bass drops out and you know what's going to happen. So you're like, yeah, you know, and then you know the bass is going to come back. And there's a lot of safety in knowing that the bass is going to drop again, right? Because you know that's going to happen. So it's sort of like a horror movie or a uh, police procedural. Everybody knows how it's gonna, you know, what's gonna happen in the end, but it's like you go, it's a, it's a, it's a roller coaster ride. Um, you know, and so in that sense, it's like this big dopamine dump, which is really fun and good for you, but on the other hand, it's what my mother would call um, empty calories. You know, it's like drinking, a, she's like, I don't want a Coke, a Coke is too, it's just empty calories. I'll get a Diet Coke, you know what I mean? <laughs> but that's another, th okay, so, you understand the contours of pop music and it's a safe place to be and dance music in the club is a safe place to be. So uh, what does transcendent mean? Let's define our terms. Look, here's a timer. So th I know that this is fantastic. Is it 20 minutes we have? Damn, yeah, yeah, you had to speed through. You jumped over all kinds of stuff. Okay. Transcendent. This is a word. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the authority on all things, uh, transcendent is beyond or above the range of normal or physical human experience, right? Sound. Sound are vibrations that travel through the air or another medium and can be heard. In other words, it could be water or, you know, again, the Oxford English Dictionary. So what I am talking about is uh, transcendent sound and this is something I need to talk about in a personal way because as I said it, uh, the role it serves in my life is as of a piece with my meditation practice, which is called Vedic meditation, which involves using a mantra. It's similar to transcendent meditation, but I'm not like a weirdo and I'm not in a cult and I'm not uh, into corporate, you know, what I anyway. So, so uh, it's really uh, done a lot for my life and I found to the same experience in these uh, sort of concerts that I'm going to describe to you. Transcendent sound produces awe, as in A-W-E, right? Um, so, uh, let me see. And it is uh, magic, fundamentally. So, the w what I've discovered, let me see, where am I? I've lost my, n I've lost my, I've lost my way. Um, I started participating in these long-form endurance uh, performances um, that were associated with the, the term drone music. Now, we, this is sort of a catch-all for a lot of genres. It can uh, mean uh, ambient music, it can mean sort of electronic music, it can mean sort of neoclassical music. Um, and I think the, the, the common factor is that there's sort of a sustained tone and that uh, it isn't... Uh, time-based in the sense that 
I was in a band in the 90s, right? Um, I was in a, like a sort of math rocky band in the 90s, and I was on a major label, and we were on Sony, and the big, you know, the currency of uh, this, that, that era was writing these just perfect little gems of three and a half minute uh, pop songs, right? And it was like, this is the awesome chorus, man, that's gonna drive it home, and then this is my guitar solo, and then that lasts for only this long, and then you just, and everything, and it was just so, uh, schizophrenic and the the pressure to create these pieces of uh, these little gems that would then bring you fortune and fame was so tremendous and I'm not complaining because it paid you know paid for my rent for the whole the all the whole decade of the 90s but uh, on the other hand it also uh, did, did I think a lot of psychological damage to a lot of people that I know and who uh, you know some of whom couldn't hack it and are not with us anymore today which is weird um, so <laughs> as sort of a balm, B-A-L-M, I said, I was talking to someone um, yesterday here in Beirut and said, as sort of a bomb, and they were like, a bomb? A bomb? And I was like, no, and I realized, that, yeah, I shouldn't say bomb. A balm for this, uh <laughs> for this experience. Um, I started participating in these, uh, in these uh, endurance performances. My old friend, um, Melissa Oftemauer, who was a bass player in the band Hole and Smashing Pumpkins, um, bought a tremendous, um <laughs> she bought this gigantic um, warehouse in Hudson, New York. So that's about an hour and a half uh, north of uh, New York City. And uh, the way she describes what she does, and this is, you know, we, we were, I was sort of tangential to the creation of this thing, but this is definitely coming from her. Uh, it was it's, it's an all-encompassing immersive event featuring musicians and sound artists experimenting with sustained tones, creating a full 24 hours of unbroken sound. 24 hours was really hardcore. That's that's we're gonna we do 12 hours uh, overseas and 20, 24 hours has got to be. It's also illegal in most places to do that. So I established an organization called the Lumen Project that uh, put together a 12-hour performance uh, in Stockholm last February in a beautiful church called the, uh, the Eric Erickson Hall. So these are some photographs from that. You know, whatever. There I am, you know, just do whatever, just playing guitar. Um, but it was gorgeous, and um, it uh, relied on uh, visual components as well as uh, musical components. Um, in Malmo, I established, uh, co-established something called Dream Music, in conjunction with a, uh, co the concert hall there called Malmo Live. Um, and we've been doing 12-hour a, a events there twice. Um, so here's some photographs from that. Um, and as you can see, people are, it's a different kind of experience because uh, people are encouraged to sleep. People are encouraged to lie down. And people are encouraged to turn off their phones. Um, people are, and pe this I say encouraged because, you know, if you just, if you, try to tell people what to do, they don't, they don't like that. So it's a suggestion. That's what we're sort of saying. So that's why pr we present it. So um, here's some more, this is, you can't really see it, but anyway, people lying down. Maybe some of you were at this thing. Anyway, uh, yeah, there's some more people playing. So this is by no means new. Um, how much, how much, how's my time? All right. There's a, th one of my favorite places in New York City is a place called um, the Dream House, and that was, uh, is, is the one of the longest running uh, art installations, you might say, um, in New York City. Um, it's been going since 1962. Uh, it's a composer named Lamont Young and his wife Miriam, and they uh, established it uh, in, 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 in 62. It's still going. It's still, you can still go there from noon to midnight every day and uh, be in this space. So um, <laughs> they describe it as a continuous frequency environment in sound and light. And so basically uh, the, 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 the mechanics of it are, are, are quite simple. It's two or three sort of sine tones. And you know what a sine, a sine tone in music, I've got a tattoo of a sine wave. This goes right? This is a, a square wave that goes so the so just so you know so 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 uh, th three sine tones right bumping against each other 
and, 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 and that's all the thing is. And they just continuously go, and it's perpetual, and it just goes, and there's light, and you lie down. And uh, uh, for some people, it's uh, miraculous, and for some people, it's, no it's um, a bunch of nonsense. For me, it was miraculous. <laughs> the first time, it was a bunch of nonsense, and then the second time I went back, I was like, I get it, I get it. Um, and that was in the mid-'90s, and then again, after 9-11, they were, they were right down near this, there, this, the, the site there. And this was true of a lot of the sort of the wellness community, a lot of yoga places and meditation spots, and just sort of threw open their doors and were, were like, come on in. And uh, the Dream House was one of these places. Uh, I mean, really, the function of all this stuff, to me, uh, is to replace, this is not part of my talk, but this is to replace what we've sort of, especially in Northern Europe and in, uh, I mean, this is true everywhere all over the world, we've pushed the church out of our lives, right? And that was a place where we could go, where human beings could go, to experience awe, to experience a sense of connection with each other, um, to experience um, a sense of connection with something greater. Um, and I don't think that, I think that these, these, these uh, you know, you take the good with the bad when you as, as you progress, and I think it's, it's nice to move uh, forward out of these sort of dogmatic traditions, but on the other hand, we've lost the sort of social aspects of it, especially in places like Scandinavia, I know I'm talking to a fair amount of Scandinavians, so you, got, you all know how it, how it works there. It's, it's a very, it's, people are isolated. It is, it is grim. Let's just be real. I mean, not all the time, but I'm just saying families, we, you know, you don't, it's, you, you don't see families living together as much anymore. And I think this, this has a lot to do with this sort of shift in towards secularization, which I think is a great, you know, which is a great thing. On the other hand, um, it's led to a lot of unexpected side effects, like what I've just described. Um, so, more about this dr the dream house really quickly. Um, what the dream house provides me, it doesn't provide any sort of conclusive statement, and it 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 doesn't come to a to a conclusion. It doesn't come to it doesn't resolve itself. So that's con disturbing to people, or, or not. It's inconclusive, so you can kind of put what you want on it. It's just a bunch of sort of sound, and you then are forced to either be like, this is nonsense and I can't take it and I'm leaving, or you lie down and you start to see what happens to your body as you experience these sort of sound waves rolling over you, and as you're forced to sort of, there's nothing to focus on, so you sort of wind up focusing inwards, and it can be very... It can be a little bit scary, but it can be um, wonderful. I mean, everybody has had this experience when you're listening to music. It doesn't matter, you know, what genre or what category, where suddenly it's just, you have this, it's a very freaky experience. Think about it, when it's just you and the music. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, it, you're the only things present for a moment, and it's, 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 it's quite intense. And when you're listening in this way, uh, you're not aware of the room. You're not aware of the bot, your body. It's it's quite amazing. Um, your mind has gone blank in this sense. Uh, you're slightly disembodied, and as I as I said, and this is exactly the same experience that uh, one one might describe a meditation experience to be. Or you know, we've all experienced sort of you know, it's nice that there's a yoga culture now, and we can talk about how that's gone a bit too far into this, you know, sort of metal yoga and, and you know, all these different sort of um, various uh, versions of it. Um, you know, but this is how, this is how uh, listening to music and how meditation and how yoga operate, they, it's just a, it's a physical uh, thing that happens, just like if you drink two bottles of wine, you're, you're going to feel like, you know, like shit the next day. It's just sort of a part of, it's a physiological experience. Um, so why does this work? Um, let's let's look at let's look at uh, let's look at uh, some of these terms to see if there's any clues. Now, sound is a noun. Again, vibrations that travel through the air or another medium and can be heard. Right, Oxford English Dictionary. We went through that. Sound equals vibration. Vibration, something vibrating. Frequency. Amplitude, which means sort of like volume, right? T uh, timbre or timber, which can mean tone color. 
it's like the texture of it or sort of, you know, how it, uh, the, the sort of shape of it, is it dull, is it sharp, is it, you know, uh, these, are, these are the components of sound. Let's see, uh, what, does, uh, what do people have to say about terms like frequency and vibration? So here's Tesla. I mean, say what you want about Tesla, but he had a few things going on. And uh, he pointed out that if you want to find out the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. If you don't like Tesla, think about Einstein. Um, Einstein, we are slowed down sound and light waves, a walking bundle of frequencies tuned into the cosmos. <laughs> so um, what are all these people talking about? Um, frequency is known as the rate per second of a vibration consisting a wave either in material as in sound waves or in an electromagnetic field, electromagnetic field as in radio waves and light. Oxford English Dictionary. Again, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So, brain waves. Um, we don't, th some of this stuff is a bit, we don't know, like we just, I, the science on it is just a little bit, is just a little bit hazy, we just don't know a lot about it. But the fact is, when you are awake in a normal state and stressed out and in normal mental activity, moving through the world and doing your thing like most of us do, 80% of people, you're operating in the beta level, where that's what they, in the, in, 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 uh, the, in testing environments, that's what they measure is beta waves in most sort of normal states of being. Alpha waves are what occur when you meditate and what, what occur when you're about to fall asleep. Um, theta waves, getting into this stuff, it's like this is, you're sleeping, and then delta waves are known as the David Lynch uh, vibration, but it's called, it's when you're in really deep sleep and you're dreaming. Here's in some more about that stuff. So uh, I see that I'm running out of time. Conclusions. Transcendent sound <laughs> encourages a shared experience, right? We were talking about this sort of loss of, 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 of spaces to experience awe and, and togetherness and the way we feel when we're singing in a choir, right? Why is this so incredibly popular in Sweden? Why is that so incredibly popular? You don't like to say hello to each other on the street. Why, you want to stand next to each other and sing? That's a really intimate thing. Um, Transcendent sound cannot be commodified. Why do I say that? Because it's too long. It's it it doesn't it doesn't can't be packaged. You can't like you can't like slap it on a CD or a uh, you can't upload it to a you know uh, uh, a server. And it's an experience. Uh, it's a it's a it's an approach. And generally, uh, with these kinds of concerts that I'm talking about, you can't experience them. They're uh, outside of the context of the thing itself. So. It can't be sold and commodified in the same way that pop music or hip hop music or dance music can be commodified. And there's nothing wrong with pop music. And I love and l I love hip hop, so there's nothing wrong with that. So intended sound is pan genre and is not culturally specific. I think that's really important, uh, especially, and I do hope you'll come tomorrow because this has been something that we've been working on for so long and I'm just so thrilled to share it with you. Um, I have no idea what's, what, what, what's gonna happen. I have some sense of what's gonna happen, but I don't, I don't have a full idea. Um, it's primarily local musicians, and I'm seeing how they interpret this format that we came to them with, and they're very open, and it's just going to be really exciting. So, uh, transcendent sound is good for your health, and I, I, I hope I've made that case, although I had to jump over a bunch of stuff because you're standing there. <laughs> All right. Transcendent sound imparts a sense of universal purpose. Um, again, I hope I made that case, but man, I don't know. I'm going to have to look at the footage. I'm going to end with this really beautiful quote. I've just jumped over a bunch of stuff, but Huxley said, after silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. I really hope you'll join us tomorrow. Um, it's uh, at the Zukok Theater. It's going to be fantastic. All the details are with Martin. I really appreciate you listening to me uh, yammering on. Um, and I uh, want to thank the speakers and Martin for having me and Sarah. Thank you so much, everyone. And Doreen. Yeah, thank you.